Okay, so this is the third part of the urinary lecture series. This is going to be the conclusion, the stunning and thrilling conclusion uh, to this three-part series. So the, we're going to start out talking about some congenital things. And this is an association question. The finding is obvious. We've got a horseshoe kidney here. So what do people with horseshoe kidneys get? Obviously, it's not formed correctly as it's still fused sort of centrally. Remember, it gets hung up on the IMA um, and gets basically trapped in the lower pelvis. Another point of trivia that I mentioned earlier in lecture two that I'm just going to mention again is that if you were going to be doing a nuclear medicine study on this person, you would image them anterior instead of posterior because this is an anterior more, it's relatively more anterior than native kidneys, which are imaged posterior. So back to the question at hand, what do these guys get more of relative to a normal kidney? So if you think about the fact that this kidney is abnormal, it doesn't function normally, and that it doesn't necessarily drain as well as a normal kidney would. And because it has drainage problems, it tends to have more reflux and it's more susceptible to getting pilo so you get more infection you also get more stasis which leads to a chronic inflammation which predisposes you to getting more cancers so TCC Wilms renal cell carcinoma and the massive zebra that is renal carcinoid is associated with horseshoe kidneys Horseshoe kidneys tend to occur more in Turner's patients, Turner's syndrome. So when you say Turner's, or when I say Turner's, you say streak-like ovaries, horseshoe kidney, bicuspid aortic valve coarctation of the aorta. Those are your Turner's, rapid Turner's associations. And lastly, they get more stones also for all the same reasons we talked about before. So recurrent stones, recurrent infections, Cancer, and I oh, forgot to mention, notice the proximity of the, or the relationship of the horseshoe kidney to the vertebral body. And you can imagine that if you had a football helmet coming at you here, that it would smash that renal isthmus directly into that vertebral body, and it's just more susceptible to injury it's not padded and hidden away as easily as the kidneys would be uh, in native situations, so they're more susceptible to trauma. And you're supposed to caution these parents, if you're a family medicine doctor, you're supposed to caution these parents that they're not supposed to play football or something like that. All right, next case. Another association case. So this is an ultrasound, obviously. It's a bladder ultrasound. A couple of things to think about when you're dealing with a bladder ultrasound. Masses, rhabdomyosarcomas, actual things within the bladder, bladder cancers. You would love to see flow if they were showing you a mass. That way you could tell the difference between a clot, which would be much more common than a bladder cancer. And then you've got various diverticula and this entity. So this sort of looks like a cobra's head, that's a buzzword, and this is a ureterocele. And when I say ureterocele, you say duplicated system. So something like that. So what do you need to know about duplicated systems? Well, they're duplicated, which means that there's an upper pole and there's a lower pole, different collecting systems, and they they can join early on, but for the purpose of multiple choice test, that doesn't happen. For the purpose of multiple choice, they both insert into the bladder and they follow the Weigert-Meyer rule, which means that the upper pole inserts inferior and medial, and that the lower pole inserts superior and lateral. And if you can remember sort of the way that this is drawn, or you can think that the upper one stretches down further and the lower one think that the lower one would go further, right? Sort of counterintuitive, but the lower one actually stops short. 
and lateral. An additional thing to take from this picture is that the upper pole tends to obstruct and the lower pole tends to reflux and scar. And this creates that drooping lily appearance if it was 1970 and you had to do an IVP. That's that drooping lily appearance of the collecting system where you have an obstructed upper pole and a scarred up lower pole. Now a couple of other things to think about is that duplicated systems are associated with ectopic ureter placement and for males you can end up having insertion very low in the, into the prosthetic urethra and then females they can actually have insertion into the vagina which obviously causes incontinence. All right, next case. So the point of this is another association case is to show you that they're missing something. These are always the hardest types of cases of the, the, the what is not there cases, you know. Which Waldo is not wearing socks? Uh, this one's obvious because, you know, a kidney's a big thing. You may say, well, it's just out of plane, but let's pretend that this person only has one kidney. So... One kidney should make you think about GYN spectrum malformations. And I'm going to give you my whirlwind tour of how I look at this embryology and how I remember some of the different associations. So the way I think about it is that you start out with two bowls of stuff, one on the left and one on the right. And these bowls of stuff are going to make your kidneys and your uterus. It's all the same soup, okay? So... As development occurs, the soup gets poured, poured down. And the first part of the soup makes the kidneys, and the bottom part of the soup is going to make the ureters. So it's getting poured down here, poured down, poured down, poured down. And when it gets to the bottom, it fuses and makes a uterus. And ended up with a uterus that looks something like this. But because they get all mashed up together, you know, you have two sides and one thing, you know, you, you don't have a central cavity yet. You've got soup from one side and soup on the other side. So there is a normal cleavage that occurs, and that occurs from bottom to top like this, like it gets zipped up or zipped out. So this can get fucked up three main ways. You can either not have soup to start with, or be missing some soup, and that way you don't form. You can <coughs> fail to fuse, or you can have cleavage failure, which is the last step. So let's talk about failure to form. So like I talked about earlier, we've got two bowls of soup, but what happens if you only have one bowl of soup? like on one side. Well, then this would be a situation where you only have one kidney. So the other kidney's not going to form, and then you're not going to have any soup to make the other half of your uterus, so you're going to get stuck with half a uterus. Some people call this a unicorniate uterus. And you can also have a rudimentary horn, and this is the most common association with a unilateral kidney. So what about failure to fuse? So we talked about that the, the soup gets poured down and you end up with a little bit on one side and a little bit on the other and that's supposed to naturally come together. But what happens if they miss and that they don't end up lining up or they only partially line up? They get like stuck halfway together. There's two basic scenarios. You can have two separate pieces of soup next to each other, or you can have the two pieces of soup that touched, but they touched in, incompletely. So if you have no fusion at all, that's a didelphus. And if you have partial fusion, that's a bicorniate. And you can see that these pathologies are sort of brother and sister because they happen along the same spectrum. 
And because of that, they both have an association with the vaginal septum. Lastly, we can have a screw up at the failure to cleave, which was that last step. So remember that this happens from bottom to top. So if it only happens part of the way and then it stops cleaving, then you end up with a septate uterus. So how do you tell these two things apart? They both sort of look like they've got a divot kind of thing going on here. They look pretty similar. Is there a way to tell them apart? The answer, of course, is yes. You tell them apart by looking at the fundal contour. So notice that it's flat on top over here. And then on this side, it's, it's got a dip. Sort of looks like a heart, heart-shaped. This, this box is heart-shaped. So our heart-shaped box is a bicornuate. And the way to remember that is, remember this is bicornuates or when they don't fuse all the way is an incomplete fusion but there is some fusion and at the top it's not fused so it's sort of like flopped apart like a heart the septate fuses normally it's just a apoptosis failure of the septum so the top part of the uterus is fused normally and has that normal rounded contour you just have a muscular or fiber septum that's left over. Like that. So which one of these guys, or do they both, have fertility issues? This is high yield trivia. You'd think that they would both have fertility issues, but they don't. Allegedly, allegedly, the bicornuate uteruses have normal fertility. They're not at increased risk or at not, it's not substantial increased risk for um, fetal loss. Whereas the, the septate does, and here's the way to remember that. The real issue is not a size issue. You'd think, well, you don't have room for a baby in there. But remember, you can have an octomom or whatever and have 20 fucking kids at the same time if you get enough uh, fertility drugs on board. So you can jam a bunch of babies into a uterus, right? A bunch of babies. So you may have preterm delivery of those babies and increased risk for uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip and whatever, well, you know, very stuff like that. But you, you can stick a bunch of babies into, into a normal-sized uterus. So you can probably fit one baby into a half-a-sized uterus. The issue is with implantation and blood flow. That septum's not supposed to be there. It's not a normal thing. It's supposed to go away for a reason. It doesn't have normal blood flow. So if the embryo implants on that septum, it can't generate the normal like blood flow reactions that it needs to, to grow, so it causes early loss. So it's an implantation issue that actually leads to infertility, not a size thing, and that's how to keep these things straight. Now you can treat the septate uterus by resecting that stump, and that's why it's important to tell the difference between these two, because if the bicornuate person, for whatever reason, is having fertility issues and they're getting a fertility workup, and you call that a septate uterus, and they go and, quote, resect the septum, which isn't a real septum, that it can actually even cause more problems and make it worse. And it will make it worse for you, too, because you'll be getting a letter from a lawyer. So don't screw that up. Look at the top of the... Look at the top of the... So actually, there's two ways to handle this. The first way to handle it is to avoid these studies on the list if you don't know what you're looking at. Just act like you didn't see it. If you get forced to read it somehow then uh, 
remember to look at the, the fundal contour. And on the test, look at the fundal contour. All right, so next case, there's a, I prompted you that this person is a dude and you may or may not have noticed that he is missing a kidney. Remember, coronal plane, coronal plane, what do you look at in the coronal plane? Kidneys, bile ducts, spleen. And if it's a cut more forward, you look at the bowel. So what's that thing? What's that thing? It sort of looks like a cyst. So the I've already prompted you that this is a renal agenesis association case, but we have a boy this time instead of a girl. So it's not going to be a GYN malformation thing. It's something else. So you can have, there's a thing called Zinner syndrome that's associated with an absent kidney and also has a whole bunch of other crap missing too, including the vas deferens. And they can get seminal vesicle cysts. There's also an association with seminal vesicle cysts and polycystic kidney disease, which I think I touched on before, but if I didn't, I'm mentioning it again now. So they all go together. So that last cyst that we looked at, the seminal vesicle cyst, that was off midline. This thing's right dead smack in the middle. And that's an important distinction as they, of course, have different names for them. So the seminal vesicles are on the side. So what's in the middle? I think in the middle is the prostate. So this is a prostate utricle cyst. So things to know about these guys. They can communicate with the urethra. And because of that, you get stagnant urine, right, which causes inflammation, and that can increase your risk of cancer. And... Just like the seminal vesicle cyst, these things are also associated with unilateral renal agenesis. So as a rapid review here, the midline cyst is the prostate utricle cyst. The more lateral lying cyst is the seminal vesicle cyst. So let's do a sort of a rapid review of lower urinary tract cancers. So this is a fluoroscopic study where this patient has had their bladder out. They've got some kind of small bowel urinary drainage here. And it looks like they've got a Foley catheter in. And through that, they've injected... Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe this is just sort of a delayed IVP kind of thing. But regardless, and, and no, well, I don't know. Let's just say they injected contrast through there. We have both ureters tied into this thing because there's not a bladder anymore. The person's probably had their bladder resected. Why do you get your bladder resected? You get your bladder resected because you had bladder cancer. That's sort of the where I'm going with this case. Anytime you see somebody with small bowel urinary drainage, assume they've had bladder cancer. And I guess it's possible they could have had some really severe trauma, but we're going to go with they had, they had cancer until proven otherwise for the purpose of gamesmanship. So we've opacified the ureters, and the finding is this area of narrowing here. See, that's abnormal, right? There's a caliber change there. If that was in the esophagus and you were doing a, a barium swallow, you, you'd say the person needs endoscopy, right? So let's have a look. A CT. We've got some enhancing soft tissue there, right? And plus it's dilated proximal to that. So that's that's abnormal, right? That's a TCC. So where does TCC happen? Is there any kind of epidemiological trivia that could be testable? The way to remember that is to think about where the urine's at. Because urine is inflammation and inflammation equals cancer. So I've color-coded this here. Obviously, there's a lot of urine sitting in the bladder all the time, so it's just sitting there, and cancers in the bladder are much more common than the ureters because of that. And then the second place where there is stasis of urine is in the renal pelvis. Prior to it sort of funneling, you know, you have a big bucket going into a little tube, so it gets backed up, 
So it's sitting there, so that's the second most common place. And then sort of rapidly goes down until there's a holdup getting into the bladder, and you could think about that as sort of the bottom third. So bladder cancers are the most common. Renal pelvis is more common than the ureter. And if you do have a cancer in the ureter, it's most likely to be in the bottom third because it's sort of sitting. We can think about it like columning there as it drains. As it, yeah, the bladder's a lot more, and it's all to do with urine. Okay. Let's go back to this for a second just in, and touch on just a few pieces of trivia that if you have a cancer in the upper one-third of the ureter, you probably have it in multifocal areas too because if you had enough inflammation in the least common place, then you probably are getting set up, if you're a smoker or whatever, you're set up also for a bladder cancer too. So if you have a ureter cancer, you probably have a bladder cancer. If you have a bladder cancer, you don't necessarily have a ureter cancer. Something interesting to think about. Okay, so two different bladder masses, this versus that. We've got one that's sort of centered in the posterior bladder, and then we have another one that's centered in the anterior, and I will tell you that is the midline. I want to point something else out, too. Notice these punctate calcifications here also. That's relevant. So mucinous tumors form calcifications, just like the calcifications you see in the liver with adenocarcinoma of the bowel. If you see a uracal remnant, then you need to think about, and it has any calcification in it at all, you need to be worried that there's an adenocarcinoma there. We're going to review these. And then this, there's this other bladder thing that's got calcification in it. And when you see that, you should think schisto, which is a very common worldwide problem. And schisto gives you squamous cell. So what about this thing? Looks like there's a cystic thing underneath of the bladder. We'll look at the same patient, pan through on some axials. See that? It's like a, it's like a diverticulum. All right, so let's review. So, just like the uracal remnant, remember the uracus is that thing that is a midline embryological remnant that, because you you start out peeing out of your belly button apparently, and then that obliterates. And if it doesn't obliterate completely, you're left with a little stump of uracal tissue there. And there's a spectrum. You can have a little tiny um, sort of triangular-shaped remnant thing. You can have cysts, and they can get infected and stuff. But the big thing that you worry about when you have a uracal remnant is getting cancer. Remember, I, I mentioned before, think about that picture with the calcifications. That is an adenocarcinoma, which is different than the conventional bladder cancers, which are transitional cell. And that's also different than the schisto-calcified bladder cancers, which are squamous cell. Now, just like the uracal remnant, you can imagine urine sitting in that like second part of a bladder and getting inflammation and stuff. Think about that the same way you think about this diverticulum, because that is also prone to adenocarcinoma as a cell type of cancer. Now this first part of the urethra, the part that's where the prostate is, that's most close, it's the closest to the bladder. And because it's the closest to the bladder, it gets the same kind of cancer as the bladder, which is transitional cell. And then the last part of the urethra is the penile part. And the way that I remember that it gets squamous cell is because it's the other kind, the other one's the other one. And if you've, we've done those 
two. We've done adeno, we've done transitional. The other one that's left is the other one. The other one's the other one. So this is the end of part three. And our next lecture is going to finish up some reproductive issues in the ovary and the uterus, followed by some male reproductive issues. Get excited about that. <laughs>